for this morning as we walk along through the book of Matthew this year comes from Matthew chapter 17. I'll be reading uh, 1 through 9, and I'm reading from the New International Version. Here are the words of the New Testament according to Matthew. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, up on a high mountain by themselves. While they watched... Jesus' appearance was changed. His face became bright like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Then Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you want, I'll put up three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While Peter was talking, a bright cloud covered them. A voice came from the cloud and said, This is my son, whom I love, and whom with I am very pleased. Listen to him. When his followers heard the voice, they were so frightened, they just fell to the ground. But Jesus went and touched them and said, Stand up. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw Jesus was now alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone about what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord.
If you haven't figured it out already, this morning we approached transfiguration. Transfiguration means metamorphosis, a complete change into something new. That's what the three saw on the mountaintop that day. That's what the church is called to do today. Let go of everything you were, including perhaps the parts that are more trappings of social status, and instead get very serious about Jesus. In order to do that, we have to train ourselves to be like Moses that Sandy read this morning, and Jesus, folks who can translate the word of God in a way that is not for ourselves, but for the transformation of whole communities of people. Have you ever had a mountaintop experience? I'm sure some of you might say, yeah, I'm pretty sure I did. Some of you may still be waiting, thinking that you've never had one. This morning I suggest to you to look back over your life and look at those times that you too were in awe, but perhaps didn't see it as a mountaintop transfiguration. You know, one of those moments when the kingdom of God feels close enough to touch, and the love and the mercy and the justice and the grace of God seem to be flowing in all around you, and you can almost see that God is smiling at you. You know those other moments when they happen unexpectedly and all of a sudden you are somewhere, perhaps at a concert, uh, perhaps in church, perhaps remembering an old scripture, uh, perhaps outside taking a hike through the woods, and yes, even perhaps standing on the shore of Lake Huron in a different mode than we've been lately, and you were in awe of that body of water. Or maybe even it was as you were standing looking at a piece of art, and you knew there was something there that you couldn't actually name, but it did, oh, in your soul. I know a lot of Christians have had that experience. Experience that's like seeing a little piece of the kingdom or a snatch, snapshot of those cloud of witnesses around you. And that can be a turning point in your life. In Scripture, we read today that Peter and James and John got to have a moment like that. It is literally a mountaintop experience for them, and that's where the name came from. I need another mountaintop experience. When you think about that, think of those three privileged men who were there when they actually saw God, as close as a human could get to it, transformed into something they really couldn't name. Well, let's go to Peter. <laughs> Man, I love Peter. There he is. And all of his curiosity and his outspokenness and all those things that we love about Peter he just can't help himself. And in that very holy moment, 
he says, Lord, it's really good to be here. Can you just hear him? Now, I guarantee you, he wasn't looking up at Jesus as a, at that point because the light had to be so profound and glorious that he, couldn't, he had to shield it with his eyes. So here he is going, Lord, it is so good to be here. Now, what's not said there in Scripture that I'd, I'd like to propose to you is that his little mind was going, boy, and, and I want to stay here forever. So he says, instead of that, which is truly human and selfish, right? He says, Lord, how about if I put up a tent for each one of you three guys? And then we can stay here as long as possible. That's not too far from, I think, how I would feel about this situation. I don't know about you. So Jesus says, Peter, I'm sorry. But no, we can't do that. Now, you know what? I wasn't on a literable mountain uh, a few years ago. I was uh, at a camp retreat with 125 freshman college students. And we took the bus, and down the road we went about three and a half hours from where we were in Ann Arbor. And uh, some of you might have been there. It's called Camp Spring Hill. It is a, an amazing, amazing facility. And we were there for a weekend retreat with six weeks into their first semester as college students. So if we do the math, we can figure there were, they were pretty much 18 and 19 year olds. So off we went. I was tired. I just taught all week long. <laughs> and you know, 18-year-old people, or thereabouts, have a whole lot more energy on Fridays. And so that bus was rocking. I do mean rocking. They were talking and, you know, high-fiving and, yo, bro, we're on the way. And, oh, my goodness. And all the women were like, oh, my hair, my hair. You know, and, and all of the things. that. But they, too, were excited. We pull into Camp Spring Hill, and they were hungry. And uh, so we try to give them directions. Uh, my colleague, uh, Reverend Dan Flynn, was with me. We used to be crazy enough to be the only two volunteers that would go do this for a weekend and give up a weekend. And Dan was of like mind as me, and we loved, we loved talking to fresh, new minds. And so we said, all right, all right, everybody, chill out, chill out. First thing you're going to do is get off the bus and that, see that big, tall building over there? That is the dining hall. We didn't have to say any more. <laughs> there they all go. See, food is, is definitely essential, all right? So they go and they eat the food and everybody, and we get them all in the cabins and everything is peachy. We say, okay, meet up at 8.30 here at the campfire, campground thing, okay. Several of the women get lost. Etc. We get them all down there, and we're sitting around the fire, and Spring Hill does it right, I just got to tell you, because they don't build a fire. They build a bon fire. Okay, that, that campfire was torching. And here are 125 of us, and my good buddy Dan and myself, and we get up and we start the what was going to be a conversation, meditation, and we stand and we, we don't say anything. All of a sudden, everybody just starts to quiet down, you see. You know? <laughs> it's like the honchos are saying nothing. What's supposed to happen here after they got, like, wait a minute, there's nothing happening. It's just like today. Uh, students then were, you had to do something every minute, right? Because it was the weekend. So after they all got done with all of that and realized that we were just standing, admiring the fire, there was total silence in those woods. And all you could hear was the crackling and sparking of that blaze. And as we stood at the head of the circle and we looked around, 
I saw 18-year-old kids' faces change right before my eyes. And that became, for me, a holy moment, one that I did not want to leave. At some level, those 125 young folks about to launch onto a new path in their life were as stunned as I was about looking and feeling the warmth of the light, the heat on their face, and the beauty of simply being. It was really at that moment that I needed to not just be a professor, but I needed to be a minister for the light of Jesus Christ. You see, God created us not to be with him in heaven first, but to be here on earth first. And because we perhaps have seen a transfigural moment around the glory of God, and perhaps in your life you might have had that awe-struck moment, be it in the woods, <laughs> be it in an art gallery, uh, be it with close friends, be it with a homeless person on the streets of Ann Arbor, these moments happen everywhere. I suggest to you that each one of you just needs to look for them and accept and be ready for them when they happen to you. Friends, that's the meaning of transfiguration the transfiguration story. To witness the glory of God, which so often we just take for granted as we age, you know? It's like, I absolutely am certain God is there for me. And I've been certain from it, and some of you out there, I'm sure, can say, since I've been five years old going to Sunday school, or whatever your narrative is. But God assures you that there will be mountaintop experiences for you. Maybe one, maybe more. And it maybe is a matter of degree, because if you look at a mountain range, don't you view this, and this, and this? And guess what? These aren't just hills. These are mountains. And in between those mountains, indeed, there are, funny how I didn't have to fill in that blank, did I? God says to you, there are mountaintop experiences, and if you open your eyes and your heart, I will fill them with my glory and my grace that'll be so bright that you will have to bury your eyes. I have had those moments. I come down the mountain, as Jesus said to Peter, James, and John, we can't stay here, fellas, because that's eternal life. That's the life beyond where I have ordained you to be right now. You will see that again, but not for a while. And so now, my friends, and I say to you now, my friends, we will have to walk down the mountain, and yes, we will have to walk through some valleys. But if you have experienced the top, 
you will be transformed, transfigured, metamorphized. And you can't ever be as low as you were before you walked and saw the mountaintop, you see. Because you are transformed. So what does God want us to do now? Man, Lord, you showed me the best there is, and my little human body felt peace and love and grace and contentment. Man, it didn't get better than that around that fire that night at midnight. And man, have I been in different places since then in the last 30 years. But I'm different because of that. I'm different because God now said to me on the way down the mountain, as he said to his three disciples, don't necessarily right now tell anybody about this. Get this. He didn't say, don't ever tell anybody about your mountaintop experience. He said, don't say anything right now until the Son of Man has been risen from the dead. And then get fired up again and go tell people what you experienced. Because there are plenty of people in the world without any hope. And I hate to break it to you, my friends, but I am a truth teller, and I will tell you the truth as I know it. You may be in a valley, and you may be desolate, and you may be depressed, and you may be just saying, Lord, please. But if you listen to the words this morning of this amazing event, and if I have shared a personal story with you, that lets you know you can have here on this earth a similar experience that will lift you up out of the valley just a little bit, then you have the responsibility to take your experiences and provide hope for others who have no hope because they don't know any different, you see. Whether you are now different because you have heard the words of Scripture expressed by people that you believe in, then it is your responsibility to go through life not like this. Hi. How's it going? You have the responsibility to go through life like this. How are you really? I don't know whether you notice me, but every time I come up to somebody, I very carefully try to say, how are you really? Now, that doesn't mean sometimes you can get caught, and an hour and a half later, you know the full story. That's a risk you take. That's a risk you take. And sometimes, with the grace of God, you can carefully respond to that. You don't have to tell every problem you've had since you were three years old in one setting. But it can, I can encourage you to give, not the, oh, everything's great. When I look in your eyes and I know everything is not great, you know it and I know it, right? But it happened to me this morning, one particular individual here, how's it going really? And it's, it's good, it's good. I pause. Is it just, okay, yeah, it's really, all right. You know, it's more like it's just all right. And if we really stopped longer to talk about it, it really almost isn't all right. It's just getting through. Do you see how you can mitigate that down? So, so I challenge you this week when somebody says to you, how's it going? And you can tell they don't really want to know. They want the preferred answer, right? Good, how about you? Good. Okay, it's okay to say, I'm getting by. Whatever, 
words come. You know, we're hanging on. That's not destitute. That's real and truthful and honest, my friends. And then your response can be, love you, <laughs> know that, hang in there. A, a real truthful response, you know, God's, God's peace to you. Because that's something you can always reassure people of. God's peace to you. And that's a hopeful statement because you can almost then guarantee they're going to go, I hope so, and maybe they'll feel it or be reminded of it. So here we are. We went to the mountaintop. And yes, we all wish we could stay there. But scripture tells us even Jesus, here it is, even Jesus himself had to come down from the mountain and walk through the valley to death before he could come back up to the eternal mountain. And may God never take you so far down that you think you cannot look up. But if you do, I suggest you do look up at the mountaintop and not think the climb is too great, I'm too old, I'm too infirm, I'm too fill in the blank. But from in the valley you look up and say, and God is such a bright light, I have to look down. Amen.